Um, I think we are ready. So hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Shana Weiss. I am the Associate Director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. We are so excited to welcome you here for the third meeting of the Studio Israel series. This series is a collaboration between the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, the Jewish Arts Catal uh, Collaborative, and of course, the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. We wanna thank um, the CJP Arts and Culture Grant for their support. Um, and today we are going to learn about fashion and hear from some of Israel's contemporary designers. And of course, clothes relate to personality and feelings, but also group affiliation and social categories, right? They mean both things for the individual, but also for society at large. And we can think of countless examples of clothes and meaning, right? Hillary and her pantsuits, Hillary Clinton, Lady Gaga and her meat dress and everything in between. And of course, Judaism also has a lot to say about garments and accessories, whether it be jewelry for the high priest, uh, the talit, the prayer shawl for prayer, tefillin, leather straps that bind one to God. Fashion is connected to the body. It's connected to holiness about gender and difference. We are so lucky today to hear from some of Israel's top designers whose creations tell us about the world that they live in and how Israel represents itself in the world. I'll give it to you, Galit. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. So um, uh, thank you everybody uh, for joining us today. I'm going to share a screen and to take you, uh, Shaina, you are in a big screen on my screen. Um, just how I'm going. Oh, so I'm going to share a screen and to take you um, quickly with me uh, to one sec to a 15 minutes journey to the history until nowadays. And then of course we will meet the five talented creators that are uh, joining us today. So my name is Galit Reisman and I chose to introduce myself as fashion entrepreneur and a lady that believe in people and the spirit of Israeli creation. I am myself uh, driven by the curiosity to investigate the DNA of Tel Aviv and the emerging Israeli fashion scene. And today I'm going to open for you a glimpse uh, to our fascinating uh, fashion hub. So for me, how it's all started, if we're talking about fashion, actually, I will say that I wasn't always in fashion. Uh, I took the traditional route after the army and uh, finished in a college education studies of media, media and communication and immersed myself in this field. But only in the age of 30, all the dots connected and I took a um, sharp turn back to my heart, that is fashion. And I was lucky in the age of 30 to start to represent a collective of Israeli uh, accessories designers in the US market, uh, flew frequently to New York and work with buyers all over the state and Canada, leading more than 35 trade shows at the Javis Center. But in Back then I started to realize and be exposed to the talent and innovation and, and the beauty that the Israeli creation uh, brought. And with the uh, big uh, missing to Tel Aviv, I free my spirit higher. And in the age of 35, I founded TLV Style, the first and leading fashion tourism service aiming to bridge between the international communities like you and the local creative community through a unique tailored experience. I'm leading my guests in private and group tours uh, to the behind the scene, uh, to the human spirit, as well as leading event inside and outside Israel, all with the same mission to engage, to educate, and to inspire my people with the story of the local fashion industry. I want to give you a glimpse um, until you will visit Israel after this pandemic, how it feels to be in the fashion tours on ground. Thank you. 
still my biggest inspiration. And I love to quote Coco Chanel that you just said that fashion doesn't exist only in a dress. Fashion exists in the sky and the birds and in the people, stories and places. And this is exactly what we're going to experience today. So how it's all begin. The lady that you see in the picture, Chemda Ben Yehuda, that was the wife of Eliezer Ben Yehuda who revived the Hebrew language. She was the lady that coined the word fashion in 1904 and introduce it to the covers of the Hebrew press. She was actually the first fashionista who spread a trend that came from Paris and immersed in her stories a lot of about female empowerment. But when Israel was established, the country was dealing with the question, what character the country will wear? And following that, we confide two groups of uh, different aesthetic idols that were differ in, in terms of production and design and marketing. And that was resulted of two opposing ideologic, the socialism and the liberalism. The socialism uh, was mostly represented by the company Atta. Atta founded in 1934 by Ehrlich Muller, a Zionist socialist who immigrated from Czechoslovakia and led the mission, the vision forms follow function. Uh, fashion with straight lines and lack of decorative, actually such as the Bauhaus that was so popular in the 30s. We should remember that most of the inhabitants back then in the days were people that came after the Second World War without money in their pockets, and they mostly were focusing in recovering the family unit and to build the country. And therefore, this period of austerity characterized by the utility fashion, and that goes together with the socialism. However, in the other hand, we had the liberalism that was mostly um, identical with the wealthy people that settled in the first Hebrew uh, city before the establishment of Israel. And they brought the style of the Parisian glam. I'm talking about the European industrialists, the tailors, the leading couturists, and the professional photographers. And actually, thanks to them, between the um, 30s to the 50s, the Israeli salon could flourish. But I want to mention also the lady Lola Bear, that she was the main uh, couturist back then, the tailors that was resonated with the liberalism. She also immigrated from the Czech Republic in 39. And she used to say that between the khaki and the American colony, between this and this, there is nothing. She really considered herself as the national dresser that came to Israel to blossom Israel herself. And of course, we cannot start the journey without mentioning the two inspiration uh, of the founding women in fashion. Two women that I see them as the first female entrepreneurs in Israel and their legacies are filters to our society. Of course, I'm talking about Miss Ruth Dayan and Miss Lea Gottlieb that we will hear later more about her. And both of the ladies were mostly, they started their um, businesses in the 50s. They were fashion uh, entrepreneurs, as I said, and they mostly recognized with opportunities in their time. And the fact that they took the Israeli folklores and they poured them uh, into their fashion brand. If I'm talking about mesquite, I want to mention the legendary uh, woman that only last February, last February 5th, this peace activist, Mesquite fashion uh, founder Ruth Dayan passed away uh, in the age of 103. Uh, this the entrepreneur and the humanitarian detected all her life to bridging cultural dividers. 
Uh, and with the help, of course, of the Hungarian uh, couturist Fini Leidestroff, that was working with her for 15 years, Diane created styles that were uh, em embellished with embroider em embroidery and other accents done by immigrants like the Bedouin, the Druze, the Palestinian, the Lebanese, and the Syrian women. But before going uh, quickly uh, on our timeline, I want to mention a few steps. Uh, in the 70s, that was the blooming in Israel. The textile industry was flourishing. Uh, mesquite was in their peak. It was after the Six Days War. And in the 70s, uh, star, they uh, opened the leading fashion school, Shankar that even rewarded in place six in the world a few years ago by BOF. In the 80s, with the globalization, started the change in Israel, not only because of the production in the Far East that affected the textile industry and the industry, uh, her, all the industry itself, with shrinking the, the, the factories until they shut it down completely, as well as the company the government pulled their hands from investment. And that was the beginning of the rise of the emerging designers in the 80s and 90s, as maybe you are aware to the names like Doreen Frankfurt and Gideon Oberzon that started their career back then. But today the situation is different uh, totally. I mean, in the, if in the past we had only iconic fashion store, few iconic fashion stories, today we have booming of emerging young designers that uh, once they graduated from the fashion academy and immersed themselves into the, the industry, they don't have where to go to interns. We don't have uh, fashion brands and fashion houses in Israel to learn methodologic and techniques. And because of that, they quickly become independent, what I love to call them, the fashion entrepreneurs. And they are facing a lot of lack of, lack of uh, support from the government and lack of materials and size of the market and the buying power. And of course it goes on and on like the craftsmanship that are people getting old in Israel and people really need themselves learned the uh, methodologic of creating uh, craft in Israel. But on everything, uh, fly the threads of the fast fashion as we know it. And I chose to put two Israeli uh, companies that produce in China. But of course, in more than the last decades, a lot of the international brands like Zara, H&M, uh, Mango, et cetera, et cetera, entering our market. And they're standing against of all the young independent designers that are part of the slow fashion movement. And what defines slow fashion are designers working in their original country, doing everything handmade in small quantities and mostly supporting the fair trade that luckily we don't have child labor in Israel. And that uh, topic, one second, what happened? Sorry about it. That topic is part of the discuss on the slow fashion world. I would like to mention the collapse of Rene Plaza textile factory in Bangladesh. Uh, on its thousand of workers. And that event was known as the greatest disaster in the history of textile industry and was the turning point of the awareness of the importance of the human rights that our fashion designers, the slow fashion designers are taking part uh, in. And I want to finish with this amazing lady the leading uh, trend forecaster in the world, Lee Edelcourt. And she is also saying that uh, maybe even the situation and the, the period and th that we are uh, facing now under COVID-19 uh, pandemic is, is, is a gift because the end of fashion as we know it started before the pandemic. The fashion with the big F as we knew, knew it is not longer exist. And maybe the pandemic will be a moment to rethink, to deepen our need for more value fashion. And this may be the came back value of textile that can bring us the host new ideas and values clothing. And that bring me 
to give the stage to my designers, uh, our designers in Israel to open a door to this value, beautiful, innovative creations that they are doing. And the first speaker will be, of course, Tamar Bronitsky, uh, a textile designer that uh, represent for me beautifully uh, one of the most important values that I love to share in uh, TLV style tours, the topic glocality. And I myself always searching the local inspiration source in the designer's creation uh, before even they're breaking into the international market. And Tamar does it perfectly. While her artwork is inspired by the landscape of Israel, as well as personal family roots. Uh, I welcome Tamar Barnitsky to share the screen and take us to her journey. Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you, Galit, for these warm words. Um, my name is Tamar Branitsky. I'm a textile artist and designer. Uh, I'll share the screen with you. So here it is. Okay, so uh, my creative journey started a long, long time ago when I was four years old. Uh, I'm a Shankar graduate, a Shankar College graduate, and also from Bezalel Academy. And I'll take you into a journey of my inspiration. Um, I believe that every person is a collector and every home is a museum, which means that I follow um, uh, all, of the um, all of the family pictures that I have um, from Sepharad and Ashkenaz. I started to collect uh, old pictures. This is an example of uh, how beautiful uh, the back of the pictures are. It inspired me because it really feels like uh, somebody printed on it, but it's the original uh, 1920s. Um, I explore prints and patterns, and this is my um, translation to artworks. Uh, so you can really feel the connection between these um, stains and to these uh, creative uh, wall art. Um, it's a mix of cotton and, um, and fabrics that I mix together, and then it goes through a chemical process. Um, this is my final project from uh, Shankar College. It started my studio uh, 11 years ago, and I exhibited these artworks in Paris and Milan. And when it came back to Israel, I wanted to make them wearable. And so I started with my collection of scarves. Uh, I express the ravage of time and turn it into wearable art. I developed a unique material which called um, broken silk. It's a mix of layers between cotton, chiffon, and silk, and it's handmade one by one in my studio. Um, this is me. Uh, it's before COVID-19, so you can see that I'm really uh, familiar with the gloves and, uh, and what I have on my face and looking at all these abstract um, stains that became with the fabric, uh, I started to imagine the Israeli landscape. So um, this is uh, my collection of scarves. This is one um, that is inspired by the Western Wall and, um, and the landscape of Kibbutz. I translate landscapes into poetic texture. This is the Sea of Tel Aviv. Um, maybe some of you have visited here. We have a beautiful sea, which gives me souvenirs to create with. And I take pictures every day. And uh, then I create this one of a kind uh, textile art. This is, um, this is the desert. Um, I travel around Israel. I take pictures of the dry land and the beautiful uh, sky. And then you can see, this is the translation, the creative one, how can I wear the desert? Um, the next project is a garment for Michal. It was exhibited in few museums and galleries here in Israel. And this project was related to uh, Michal. She was the most tragic lady in the Bible. And uh, I chose white colors for the garment. This is a garment that will comfort her. It's an artwork, so you can just please imagine this with me. Um, the white colors are related to four stages um, 
that a woman goes uh, by uh, Jewish religion, which is uh, we give birth, uh, we grow up, we get married, and we die. And all these four stages of life have white and beige colors. So this garment is handmade by me with the broken silk fabric. And this golden, it's golden threads here, um, and it's 1950s vintage. Uh, so I'm going back to the where I started with the family pictures, and it's the same uh, raw materials. Um, the next project is the Kiss. Um, this is a collection that I really like, and before COVID-19, I also exhibited in Philadelphia Museum of Art. It was the Philadelphia Craft Show. Um, and I try to express uh, what does the colors of the kiss have. Uh, and the famous painting is Klimt, uh, which was the inspiration. Um, so I collect leaves from the Israeli landscape and I'm quite amazed how they decay in real life, but remain with full of life in my prints. And this thanks to uh, digital print technology. So, um, I really scan them and I make this art with a, a photo, with a, um, uh, it's handmade uh, drawings and then I scan it and then it's uh, printed on chiffon fabrics. Uh, each scarf is signed by me and it's um, everything is handmade in my studio. And this is another inspiration source. Uh, we have a beautiful trees here uh, in Tel Aviv. So, and, um, and a treetop is a really sublime motif to me. Um, and when I take pictures, I just, I have dozens of pictures of treetops. And when I scan them, when I take pictures of them, it looks like lace. And this is uh, the wearable art scarf that's going from this picture. Um, going back to the desert, I also designed for the Israeli Museum and the Masada Museum collection of scarves. So you can really sense the, uh, the desert in this scarf. It's a beautiful collection um, next time you're in Israel. Um, a scarf to me is the most feminine accessory. And when I look at, uh, when I design scarves, I always think about the woman's face. I think about the colors of her lipstick. I think about what will she wear. Um, and especially these days uh, when we all have uh, a very important, um, a very important minute here on Zoom. We have here from here, so I'm always thinking about what uh, what will be the right scarf for any event. Uh, each scarf is signed by me at Wearable Art, so um, this is me in my studio. Uh, everything is handmade, and going back to our time of uh, COVID nineteen. Um, I don't know if I should wear it on my neck or hang it on the wall. This was one of the uh, reviews I got from customers. And you can sense that uh, the fitting of the sea, this is the beautiful Tel Aviv beach, and this is the translation. So we can also hang it on the wall um, as art, not only on your neck. Um, and this is also the pillows connection that uh, it's abstract prints. And each pillow is coming, well, each pillow and each artwork is coming yeah. from any collage art inspired by time, life, and the emotions within. And by sharing with you this inspiration, it's really only a bit. Um, I really hope to meet you one day in Tel Aviv in my studio when it's possible, and if not, then online. And I really hope uh, you got a sense of what it is to be a textile, local textile designer here in Israel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to, uh, uh, thank you, Tamar. I want to pass to the next uh, speaker, uh, Lady Orna. She is out there in the matrix. Orna Lifshitz uh, Barkan. Uh, actually, for me, is well known, well known for its um, successful silversmith uh, designers who bring worldwide awareness and success. Uh, but my heart stay with the contemporary 
fashion designers, uh, jewelry designers, uh, that pushes their limits to new materials and new sh shapes. Our next speakers, uh, Orna, will take us uh, with uh, her to the background of her creation, start back then in Jerusalem as a child and finished with her experience as industrial designer and her MA in art history. Um, Orna, the stage is yours. Orna? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So, hi. Thank you so much, Galit. Um, I'm very excited to see you all and to show you a bit about my creation and work. So I've established Orna Fine Design as a unique brand of jewelry and clutch bags. Um, I'm an industrial designer in origin and I have an MA in art history, um, specializing actually in early Christian art, which seems not so connected. Um, I've also studied metalsmithing, and I can say that all these fields of expertise led to the way um, to my designs and still shape my work and way of thinking. Um, all my designs are made of a unique combination between um, neoprene fabric and gold or silver tone plated brass. Uh, with this new material combination, I try to create a fine, clean, colorful, as you can see here, and fresh look that resonates classic timeless jewelry while bringing to light up-to-date fashionable and innovative contemporary accessories. Um, thinking of sustainability, although my jewelry is defined as fashion jewelry, um, I aspire that my designs will not lose their relevance just after one season, but stay relevant as long as their materials enable them. And as many think, um, after COVID-19, we will see more of this approach to fashion design and I believe to fashion jewelry as well. Um, so one of the main things that differentiates my designs derives from the material I use. Um, just to give a short explanation, neoprene fabric is a fabric usually used in the field of scuba diving, mostly for wetsuits. It's a kind of a synthetic rubber that is laminated with fabrics such as nylon, lycra or polyester. And it becomes one unit and enables me the freedom of color in my designs. As you can see, the variety is, is huge. Um, in the past few years, it has become more common also in fashion industry. So it's a kind of a shift I made, uh, the shift of the fabric to jewelry design. My main design concept was based at first on the craft of sewing as a mean of connecting the two different materials, the metal with the fabric. Um, you can see here, for example, how the metal parts take on the function of a needle. Uh, you, um, you can see it especially through the movement of my hands that resembles the movement of sewing with a needle uh, while I'm assembling this bracelet. Um, Another example here, you can see how the metal gathers the fabric as it goes through the fabric slot, exactly like a thread goes through a thinner and lighter fabric. And we can see how the falls are created. And in this last example, you can see um, this uh, clutch band that I designed and this necklace. And the metal also functions as a thread, but here a thread that stitches two or more folds of fabrics and thus creates a three-dimensional structure. Um, as an industrial designer in origin, my jewelry and clutch bags are designed to be produced partly through industrial processes. Um, these processes, mainly the cutting of the materials, give my designs this fine and clean appearance that I'm looking for. Um, after sketching by hand and making a 3D mock-ups, all designs are being sketched with CAD software and then processed to laser cutting machines, as you can see here, for example, uh, for my uh, fabrics, or to a photochemical cutting process. Uh, this is a chemical mining process used to fabricate sheet metal components using a photoresist and etchants to corrosively machine away selected areas. 
um, after cutting all the parts, they are further processed and assembled by hand. Um, my inspirations for my designs are taken from different fields of thought and interest, but there is no doubt uh, that the fact that I literally live, live in the midst of a forest in a small village near Jerusalem, uh, surrounded by nature, had from the beginning a huge impact on my designs, whether through color or structure and form. Um, it has become even more noticeable during the two first lockdowns we had in Israel trying to experience as much as I can the freedom outside, um, led to new design process in which this brooch you can see on the left uh, was its first outcome. Nowadays, aiming also to use a more natural material, I'm developing another collection that combines the metal parts with wood. Um, these jewelries uh, that can be recycled are made of plywood with veneer, also being cut by laser. Um, when coming to Israel, be an option again. Uh, one can find my designs at the Tel Aviv Museum shop, at the Eretz Israel Museum shop in Tel Aviv, and my wood collection at the Israel Museum shop. And if I can talk about a good outcome <laughs> of the COVID-19 lockdown, then I can say proudly that I have finished the design of my website and it's now available for online buyers. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Orna. And in this uh, very journey that we are experiencing, if we taste the textile creation and the jewelry, I want to go into fashion. And our next speaker, Elisha Bargel, um, before introducing uh, what I think about you, I want to return back to the lady that I mentioned, Lola Bear, and the lady, the tailor uh, person from the 30s. Uh, she used to say about her creation, and I'm quoting her. It's true that by my standard, the prices are expensive, 80, 90 pounds for sewing a dress. However, dressing properly and looking handsome is not luxurious, even though in Israel it's so so. So, our next speaker, Elisha Brajel, represents the values and the standards that Lola Bear was aiming to bring to the Israeli landscape. Um, I have to say that Elisha really pushing the boundaries of Israeli fashion, the streetwear, and the Israeli fashion culture that we have here. I personally respect his approach to fashion and admire his designs. Let's welcome Elisha. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Alicia Abergel and um, I'm a designer from Tel Aviv. I'll just share my screen with you and we can start with my presentation. Okay. So uh, I would like to start by saying that uh, I'm creating from Tel Aviv and opening my uh, presentation with a few pictures of uh, Tel Aviv itself, as you all know like uh, the landscape of the houses, the beach, the colors, the energy of Tel Aviv that we're all familiar with. The beaches, obviously, the sun and the green. This is something that all of you as tourists, if you've ever been here, you've probably experienced. But as a person who lived and created uh, from Tel Aviv, there are also different sides that um, are creating a certain kind of tension. There is something rough and something uh, that is not that is not exactly beautiful as we can describe in this city. And as a designer that creating from the heart of Tel Aviv, you're always familiar with that kind of tension between something that is, I'll say, ugly, rough, tough. Uh, the sun is, can burn you and the colors can be too intense between the beauty and the energy that we all surrounded by. So it's always something that, um, that goes with me with each creation I do. And with, with each day, even coming to the studio, you're passing by the streets. And it's very interesting to see the people in Tel Aviv because it's not a real fashion capital. But I think the intention of me as a designer is to create something vivid, something live, and something honest through the clothes I'm creating. So 
this is also a series of collages that I created that were mixed with the landscape of Tel Aviv with the Bauhaus, the white city, and the garments I created, like the colors, the green, the blue, the beach, the energy that each an outfit contains has something to do with the place that I'm creating and the city that I live in. Uh, my studio, as I said, is uh, being placed in the heart of uh, Tel Aviv in Lillenbloom Street. And we are creating in a very slow fashion kind of way. The first floor is the store and the second floor is the atelier where we're creating each piece individually. Uh, this photo session that you can see right now is something I created in my store with one of uh, uh, my clients. And each uh, look represents my special connection and bonding that I have with the clients that I meet through uh, my store and my atelier. And it's something that is very important for me to highlight because the, con the contact I create with the women that coming to my store brings a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, respect to my work. And this is something that I think is my main tool as a fashion designer. Um, the process of working, obviously, as you all know, starting in like rough sketches and different styles that you're putting with like simple pencil and a paper. And through that, I'm following like different techniques that I'm using, like I'm creating the color scheme, the samples of fabrics that each and one of them has different materials. And it's a very slow fashion kind of process. And it's very interesting because through the process, you discover so much things that you're not necessarily planned at the beginning. So it's a very interesting process to work in your own atelier. Um, hybrid. This is something that I'm relating to the fabric and the textile that I'm creating. I'm usually combining between something traditional and something technological. As you can see in that picture, the leather creates for me the more romantic, more traditional world. And I'm combining it with a mesh, which is something more high-tech technological and advanced for me in the fashion field. Um, as you can see in all those pictures, like from the middle picture of the puffer, like the nylon, the leather, it creates something very interesting to put those two materials together and try to create new look and something really fresh, vibrant that reflects my city and my work through fashion. Um, as you can see here, all the colors that I'm using are intense colors, vibrant, and I mix them with something more solid, like this navy blue, the orange, the pink. Sometimes I use neon colors to reflect the energy of the city. Uh, through COVID-19, I created a capsule collection, which is something that was a very interesting process to me. Uh, in those pictures that you see right now, um, I chose one of my clients to be the presenter of this collection. And it's a small capsule collection that creates 13 looks. And each and one of them has my signature and my handwriting in a very individual and a very unique way, but in more affordable and approachable um, way to, uh, to get. Uh, speaking about prices with Galit earlier. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, those looks are also um, bring my approach to fashion, like the one that in the middle that is combining mesh and a really has a really couture-ish essence. I'm not creating couture, but what we're doing in the studio is very similar to, I think, like petite couture, like, because we are um, emphasizing everything, like all these uh, hand, handmade details in the, in the neckline and all these Swarovski crystals that we put together and combining them with the smash and technological um, fabric to create something new and fresh, such as this look uh, on the on the on the right, that is very interesting. Oh, ooh, very interesting look to uh, to get. Like these puffers are very practical for every day, and this is something also that I think is very important as a designer from Tel Aviv to have a practical approach and not necessarily something that is super fashion, high fashion that. I don't see myself related to. Um, I also care a lot about diversity, uh, diversity with the, the persons and the women that I meet through my store. 
and the models that I want to represent my style that, and I think um, can look and bring something fresh to, to, my, to, to what I'm creating. Um, wait, wait, just a second. Um, those are all uh, photo, photo shooting. All this photo shooting was created in Tel Aviv in different places to, to show the city and the place that uh, I'm living creating in. And uh, there are different looks. Most of the looks are available on my website. So you can take a look. There are stories and each story has uh, an information about the, the reason and the ins inspiration for, for this for the specific session. A community of women, as I said earlier in the story, something that is very important to me and something that brings me a lot of joy and a lot of uh, respect to the, to the women that coming and celebrating my fashion and my clothes and the colors uh, that I'm using. And I think it's a very vivid and interesting um, thing to be a fashion designer. And it's a huge privilege to create your own handwriting and your own spirit through, with your own place. So hopefully I will be able to see you all or a few of you soon with Galit's tour. And it's been a pleasure and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy we have two comments here about the beautiful designs. And yes, this is totally a vivid and very colorful and of eye fashion. And I really um, so inspired myself to have designers like this in Israel. And if talking about fashion designers, I want to ask you if you think how we can connect Israeli fashion connection to storytelling. So uh, the next speaker uh, will be Michal Mangisto, uh, that she emphasized that beautiful connection through her fashion brand that organically thread together her heritage in colorful Ethiopian embroidery and woven textile. Her love to classic uh, feminine designs, of course, and to bring the talented craftsmanship of her community closer to the Israeli society. I'm super honored to introduce you to a different approach to fashion by Michal Mangisto. Again, I don't know where you are here in the matrix. Hi, everyone. But, ah, so you're welcome to share. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just Let's see if it's working. Time. Otherwise, I can back up you with the presentation. Michal, your camera is off. We would love to yeah. see you. Um, first, no, you need to, to allow to me to, to be a host. Uh, can you please make Michal a co-host? Yes, she's a co-host. I have to, yeah, I have to open two, okay? She has two yes. accounts. What? what is the other accounts, Michal? She's a co-host on both of them. I'm just confirming this. Okay, okay. so Michali, Thank you. Let's see if you can make it with the presentation. Everyone see me? Not the person, yeah. So we can see you, but not the presentation. Uh, we can see the presentation, but not you. If you could turn your camera no. on. Yeah. Hold it. But just don't forget to make the presentation uh, big. Like, I know, just a second. And open oh. your, uh, your camera and let's go. Okay. Everyone see me? No. No. Yes. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi again. Nice to meet you. I'm Michal Yosanish Menagistu. I hope to see, see you soon when the corona is gone. And I start to tell my story about Akal. Wow. Uh, I finished uh, uh, just a second. Someone. Uh, I finished in, at Betzalel uh, six years ago. And I think there uh, I see something uh, to me to like, uh, it's okay to bring your roots. And, and after the final project, 
I decided to bring something uh, from my uh, life and I called to my final project uh, trans transition about my roots and uh, there I think the first time I see what I want to be as a, a new designer and after I finished the uh, Bezalel uh, and I opened my first uh, uh, development brand and I decided to call them uh, Akal. Akal it's uh, it's soul in Amharic and it's something to when I asked myself how how what I want to bring to to, to the fashion and I say I think I have something because it's take me the first time and I make a liao with my six siblings and my parents from Ethiopia and and it took to me like to bring all the memories from the village where, when I, I was with my mother we took the the cotton from uh, from the in Ethiopia and I decided like just a second to bring uh, with my interpretation and all the my skills to bring uh, uh, the embroidery on the, the clothes and when when I, I think when a much uh, be published and uh, I bring my language uh, as a designer uh, I, I've been in a fashion week in Tel Aviv and the first time I say how I can combine between soul and fashion uh, and I bring all my heart and memories on the clothes and some of the in uh, Akal it's uh, uh, I, I have a women uh, working in with Akal they're uh, like a circle of women and I'm a volunteer and center in Tel Aviv. They women in like a third age, Ethiopian, it doesn't have work. And I decided to teach him and remember together the, the, uh, the skills of uh, embroidery. And these women give me like a circle giving back. They give me uh, back the, the, the roots and I give them to be involved in community and when uh, the women she know uh, after uh, half a year, she enter the work of Akal, she make uh, the embroidery and uh, when we design together. This is the clothes they uh, promote in, uh, in Fashion Week. Uh, you will see I, I, des I designer and um, stitch embroidery and drawing handmade everything. This is the white dress I made with my, my women's. Uh, uh, we uh, make embroidery and in Akal, it's very important to make for me, not just clothes, it's very, I want to bring clothes with ID. And each item in Akal, it's very tells my story deeply uh, from my memories as the Israeli society and you will see everything is handmade and uh, I made it all in Israel. It's very neat to be quality because when I'm uh, thinking about my client, she need also not just uh, buy clothes and to be in um, our closet. And it need to be like every day she need to, she go with this, not just for the museum. And, uh, like uh, I, I put, uh, make a new, a new collection in the summer as a Corona. Uh, it was like shocking for all of all of us, and and it's more. It took me to be much more uh, published, and I publish a post for my client, and uh, I ask him, "What are you feeling these days?" And everyone told me, "I'm very worried about my father, my grandma." And I decided to embroidery and uh, drawing all the feelings of my client. This is the shirt, shirt that I made. And this is the last uh, collection I made in uh, now, the winter. I think uh, ev I, I feel every hand, every step I make in my collection, 
and the first uh, time I draw in all the background in the photography. Uh, this is the clothes I made, uh, cotton. Uh, it's much more ready to wear with peace. And, and that's it. This is who I am. And you can all uh, get in and in online, akalonline.com. Thank you so Thank much, you, Michal. Michal. And I don't know who recognized Michal in my video. If you can um, uh, uh, sign out from the presentation, Michal, that would yeah, be great. Yeah, uh, uh, recognize Michal in my uh, short video, but, uh, and thank you for the challenge to share your inspiring story. But uh, yeah, it's totally different uh, experience visiting her really beautiful Inspire studio and see in real the garment. So we are waiting for you. And luckily, uh, you well, of course, last but not least, I'm super honored to introduce you our last speaker, Anna Menkes, Hannah Menkes. Uh, and actually, there are no a lot of uh, designers that their journey starts with working hand to hand with legendary fashion figure, figures. And Hannah journeys is exactly like this. But her story actually um, started uh, very far, the professional activity, very far from her synagogue as possible, her roots. But few decades only after she had connected mm -hmm. herself back to her roots, she launched her new uh, brand. I welcome Hannah to share her presentation okay. and to take us to her really, really inspiring uh, creation. Hannah, where are you in the matrix? <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> לא לא אני לא אדמי קורפון. אוקיי, עכשיו שומעים. So hello, my name is Hannah Menkes and I'm the designer and owner of Hannah Menkes Judaica brand. I loved art since I was very young and I never stopped creating for a minute. Even though I grew up in a religious home, my parents have always supported my addiction to creating. My mother says we had a wall inside our house that she used to let me paint all over it. Every once in a while, she covered this wall in white and let me paint it as a new canvas. In 1988, I present my final project in Schenker Runway Fashion Show. My project include a collection of dresses. I was fortunate that Leah Gottlieb chose to cross the street from the offices of Gotex to see the show. I have never dreamed that she would purchase my whole collection and offer me a job of a designer in Gotex. From the next day and, I, and until 1996, I worked next to Leah Gottlieb who established and led the Israeli based empire and made a world, war, a world war success. I, I remember there was a budget limited limitation for any designs. For years, I was traveling around to, inspire, to find inspiration and materials, traveling to Africa, Yugoslavia, Turkey, Hungary, Paris, London, Milan, and New York was a routine for us. I live in the morning at the studio and never know whether I will be in Achlat Binyamin or maybe in Paris. When Lady Gottlieb took a vacation in a clinic hospital in Europe and need some sunflowers to, pa to, to, paint a new to paint a new fabric, we would buy some of them and fly over there on the same day. Once I traveled to Bulgaria to, to walk through gypsy villages to find 
authentic fabrics. When the subject was ballet, I was sent to London to watch ballet performance, to read books about it, and only then designed a new collection. I have studied how to be inspired but by, by almost everything, art exhibition, a vase of flower, and a commercial magazine. After those incredible years, I worked for bathing suit companies like Scooby-Doo, Inti, and Diva. I worked in Diva for 18 years. Even when I made fashion out of 30 centimeter of fabric, I have always insist of women comfort and beauty in every size. Then I did a serious turn from bathing suits to hot couture bidaika. I grew up in a religious home in Tel Aviv, so the Jewish tradition and knowledge have always been fascinating in my blood. When my son had his bar mitzvah, I had an idea. I looked for a unique talit for him, but I couldn't find it, so I decided to make one. It has been six years that I am designed and manage the Hannah Menkes Judaica studio in Tel Aviv. I combine my, my inspiration from the Bible and the experience of fashion designer in Gothics. I create a list with Bible quotes, texture, special embroidered print designs, especially for the studio, and bright colors like turquoise purple. The courage and variety are up to the client. Each client is unique. Therefore, the products are custom made and create according to the taste. To their taste. Many men would like to be elegant, fashionable, and different in the synagogue. The talit for a man is like an evening dress for a woman, but let me tell you, a talit for a woman or a bat mitzvah girl is even more special. Usually, women order a talit or a bag for a talit or tefillin as a present for the husband or son. Inside the bag, there is a person dedication that can be embroidered. Sometimes men who purchase a talit for themselves buy their buy sidur or a purse or a chala cover for the wife. The hand making of the embroidery and the connection between all the parts take dozens of hours. Each day in my studio look completely different from the next one. Sometimes I drive all in Tel Aviv to find special silver squares for specific talit. Sometimes I look for unique fabrics in Achlat Binyamin or print some by myself. Sometimes I travel to the photographer's studio, the embroidered or the seamstress to make Sure, every part of the product create exactly how my customer order them. The products are totally kosher by the book. The tzitzit is attached and tied by a licensed rabbi and with a blessing. My products are sold and shipped worldwide through my website, internet, publication, and social media. I see Talit as a fashionable garment like my other fashion, like my other fashion object. The, the designing approach is not designed from bathing suits design. After all, this is, this is the most private, valuable object of the prayer. I have always said that I will not be satisfied Folk until I will design a colorful talit with words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I have to say, although I know the designer so well, each time for me, uh, it's, a, it's a process or it's a journey, even myself, to learn how it's such a personal uh, journey for the designers. And if in the early days of the country, the country was looking for the national garment, they couldn't find it. And that was actually this process was the beginning of the 
Israeli garment. So since then, I have to say that our melange of cultures and melange of styles and melange of aesthetics, this is what creates our uh, industry. So I want to thank, to thank all the creators that came to share. Uh, and of course, we open it to Q&A now, and I can see that um, uh, Shaina wrote the first question. So I will read it uh, for all of you. In the States, there has been a lot of discussion about making fashion accessible to all sorts of bodies, plus size, disabled, and accessible fashion, et cetera. Is this, uh, this is a conversation happening in Israel. Is it similar to different than the discussion here? So I have to say that, of course, uh, and I will tell you what is the challenge and what all the designers, since they are doing uh, individual, customized, uh, and small quantities uh, collections, they can tailor any garment to any uh, client body type. So the, it's not that they can do run size because it's very, very expensive to do all the run size, the small, the independent designers. But the benefit of being independent designer that each client can come to their studios and their cust they can customize the style and the garment to their um, uh, body uh, shape. And I know in person two designers that working in developing uh, accessible fashion to disabled people. Uh, one company is Plata uh, that you can Google and the other lady, Michal Hidesh, Israeli designer that living nowadays in Munich, Germany and working from there to develop this kind of uh, fashion. Uh, uh, collections. Uh, and of course, if any of the fashion designer want to add something, Alicia or Michal to that, you are welcome. But I hope I answered that question. Uh, curious about, yeah, Alicia. Yes, I think that the, the whole uh, conversation around disabled plus size and each uh, individual group is something that is probably more related to big brands and companies. I think that as uh, young independent designers, we have the privilege to create our own world and, and be related to our own clients. So during the time that we are creating the styles and what we're doing, uh, we know our customers better and we're not necessarily needs to be aimed to a, a, a a variety of like a big range of uh, of market like different women different styles big brands needs to do that because they need to to run their business and because it's something big but when you are small and i think that is something that is unique to all of us as a designers is that we can be focused in our vision and yeah. in what we're doing so this is something that is very important for me to say as an individual designer yeah thank you alicia uh, the next question is, um, uh, who asked that? Uh, Susan, I'm curious about who is working with natural dyes. So today, of course, uh, the, um, as I said, under the pandemic, there is more and more awareness to not only slow fashion, but to natural and authenticity and all this kind of uh, approach to fashion. But one of the pioneering, and I'm typing it uh, here, uh, Tom Wati, another textile designer working under the brand Tushaya, she's using bamboo and soy threads uh, using a hand loom machine. So she is an example. You have more and more designer using uh, natural fabric, but she is totally like a biodegradable fabric, which is amazing. So I will give that as an example. Uh, 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 do the designers sell mostly to Israeli or also worldwide? I have to say that some of the designer, like Alicia Bargell, and he can confirm that his audience is mostly uh, inter exist internationally, the American women. A lot of the Israeli designer, like Michal, and you can confirm it, working with beautiful community of Israeli designer yet. Uh, yes. All of the... Yeah, if it, I will give you the stage, but I just want to say that even now under COVID-19 pandemic with the huge challenge 
that the, the independent designer has, as I said, with the small market and with the lack of buying power, and now with the lockdowns, the international worldwide um, uh, potential clientele exists there and doing business with the designers through uh, e-commerce. So totally they are everywhere. It's beautiful to see how designers are wrapping over and over uh, packages and send it directly to um, final consumers nowadays. This is the beauty. But Michal, do you want to say something about the Israeli community? <laughs> I think that it's, there has the many to learn because it's an amazing place and you can, you can take a experience like Alicia took from the, all the colors and the shape. And that's something in the, for me as a designer, it's also to be really about the ecologic to, to took a pure a cotton or uh, like from the stock, even like not just the produce the uh, from the um, from the um, uh, how I say never mind. And it's to me as a designer, it's very uh, like uh, ecologic or uh, ecologic stuff, and that's it. Yeah, you're using a lot of natural fabric. I agree. And referring to the questions about the fashion week in Tel Aviv uh, being raised by Robin Gottlieb. I will say that uh, that was revived also, I think seven or eight years ago. And I even can uh, say that I'm honored that two of our speakers were the lottery council prize uh, during the years and been uh, participating in the fashion week, Alicia Borgel and Michal Mangisto through Akal brand. So it's a huge honor. And the fashion week in Israel is um, very unique because we have only one once a year uh, that are not following the timeline of the international uh, world celebration of fashion weeks in the world. Uh, like in Israel, we have our own rules. We don't have enough um, uh, audience, uh, media, or again, designers that can take part in fashion weeks. And since most of the independent designers are not necessarily creating two to four seasonal collections, they are doing either yearly collections, adding more and more garments over the year, or small capsule collection, they cannot do every three months fashion week. So we have once a year uh, with great um, uh, people uh, taking part of it, but unfortunately it's not leading for business. In Israel, most of the fashion um, retail based on consignment. So buyers are not coming to fashion week to see collection to buy it. Uh, so media can come, it's mostly to get uh, media coverage and internal celebration, but it's beautiful. And this year under COVID-19, we are going to have one in, the, in uh, one of the leading TV channel. So it's going to be online. So maybe you can connect. <laughs> uh, what is, I'm, I'm curious, is there, is there a movement of natural dyeing in Israel? Um, Susan, again, I don't know where are you, so I'm answering uh, to the blurred uh, audience, but I can mention, for example, we have a lot of startups also in the fashion arena, and I can mention the company Algin, uh, run by Renana Krebs. Uh, she's, she graduated from Shankar a few years ago, but since then, she opened with her father, a uh, doctor uh, in uh, biologic uh, and chemistry, the company Alging, based on uh, creating fibers from algae. So there are some uh, entrepreneurs in that field. Uh, I can send you here, Algin. I will check if that's the way. Um, yeah, before they changed, they rebrand themselves. They were Alga Life. So if you want to check it under one of these names, they just rebrand and relaunched.
but it's amazing uh, to learn about this uh, natural dyeing company. Uh, uh, Susan, can you put her info in the message? Is there something like fiber shit in Israel? Uh, one second. I am a Cambridge MA USA. Can you put the info in the chat, please? Uh, what did uh, uh, I wrote? I wrote the names. The Skedem Sasson still exists. What about Ronen Han? These designers are among some from Israel, uh, among some from Israel that are well known in other countries. So I agree. Uh, Sasson Kedem and Ronen Han are part of the uh, first and pioneering as a fashion entrepreneur in Israel, started in the 90s. They are established already, and as you all know, selling successfully across the US. Uh, in my activity, I love to put a light on the emerging uh, new generation of designers that's still under the radar, and people are less know about them, but uh, they, are, they are exist and working in successful designers. Uh, if any any of the designer want to tell a story or to add something, you are more more than welcome. What are some of the biggest current trends you are seeing in Israel fashion? Elisha, do you want to refer to that or uh, Hannah? Uh, Elisha, because it's interesting uh, question to the designer because most of the independent designers are the opposite of following trends. They are really following their own narrative. But do you want to say something about it? Um, I think you just uh, sum it up in, in this sentence. I think the minute you are following trend, you are not uh, you are not an independent designer in a way, because we are supposed to bring our handwriting and our vision, and obviously not trends. Trends is something that belongs to the mass market. So, I think the group of in designers that participating in this Zoom are more individuals and more um, unique in a way than yeah, trend. I agree. So I know I've been asked to wrap up and we are more than uh, uh, Laura and China. We have uh, time for the last question or? Let's do one more question and then we'll finish. Okay, thank you. So Suzanne asked, I would love to hear more about Michal's t-shirt. So Michal, maybe she, uh, tell us the story about uh, that we are all the same, or the heart, I don't know, uh, uh, but shortly, and then I will sum up. Okay, uh, I think it's, uh, it's much more like speak loud uh, to me as a new uh, women, black women, uh, I made Aliyah from Ethiopia, and, and I grow up uh, in my uh, house, never, everyone was like equals, I didn't see who white, who black, uh, or who doesn't uh, like uh, look like normal. And when I was like, uh, I think uh, teenager, and I said, why, why people look me like this? Because inside we are all the same. And when uh, uh, they give me the platform to produce my collection and I say, I need to do something uh, in my uh, way, and I uh, put like uh, inside we are all the same. And I think it's uh, for the next generation because it's not just uh, teach them about love, not just uh, who different or because everyone equal. And that's it. The I agree. <laughs> so fashion and fabric. Thank and you. Hannah yeah, is creating and also Tamar Bronitsky. It's a platform to pass her messages and souls and feeling. So thank you everybody. And you know, my clients in Israel after the tours, usually they, they define the Israeli fashion as brave and independent and innovative and unique and communal, but still individual. A lot of values that really reflect our story of the Israeli society. So uh, we are all waiting for you in Israel with open arts and want to thank you for listening and joining this gathering and just wish that everybody will stay safe. And thank you for that. 
Thank you so much, Galit. Thank you so much to all the designers, Alicia, Hana, Michal, Ofra. I invite you all to join us for our final meeting of the Studio Israel series on April 8th with the amazing uh, Tamar Barrer, who is a disabled dancer, meditation therapist, creative, incredible woman. And we'll see you then. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.